Hello and welcome to Psychology with me, Mr. Neo. Today we're continuing with aggression. Uh, we're still looking at the biological perspective in terms of aggression. Today, lesson three, we're looking at genetic factors in aggression. So previously we've looked at neuronal factors, which is part of the brain. We've looked at hormonal factors, which is hormones like testosterone that might affect our aggression. And today we're looking at genetic factors in aggression. So let's have a look at the starter. Aggression is passed down from parent to child through genetics. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Agree or disagree? So if you think about it from your perspective, you know, are, are you a particularly aggressive person? Is your parents particularly aggressive people? Are your biological parents somewhat, like, somewhat aggressive or not aggressive? Are you also not aggressive or aggressive in that situation? Have a little think about that. Do you think aggression is something you can pass down through genetics or is it something more psychological? Is it something you might learn to do? Is it something you might learn? Oh, they reacted in this sort of way. Maybe I learned to react in that way. Maybe it's not necessarily biological. Maybe it's an environmental or psychological factors. Think about that from, your, uh, from that perspective. Today, we're going to have a look at a few different ways in which we can understand aggression through genetics and research that are, that's looking into that. So here are our learning objectives for today. Number one, show comprehension and apply knowledge of twin studies. Learning objective two, identify and analyze adoption studies. Learning objective three, interpret and understand the importance of the Mawa gene in aggression. And then number four, examine and explain gene environment interactions. So how genes and environment may interact with each other. Let's start with learning objective one show comprehension and apply knowledge of twin studies. To understand the role of genetic factors in aggression, we have to try and disentangle these influences from those of the environment. Psychologists have several methods for doing this. These include twin studies, adoption studies, and the techniques for investigating the important role of one particular gene, the Mauer gene. So if you think back to our own example earlier, if, for example, your mum or dad are quite aggressive and then as a result, you're quite aggressive. How do I know that the reason that I'm aggressive is because uh, is because of through genetics, because of my parents were aggressive, therefore I'm aggressive because it's through genetics? Or how do I know it's not through environment? It's the environment that I was with them and I learned to be aggressive. I saw them, you know, my my dad couldn't open the cereal and then he started effing and blinding, getting really angry. So then I learned, oh, that's the way you should react in such a situation. I don't know why cereal, I couldn't open my cereal fine. That's a weird situation, but like, and, and who can't open cereal? But I'm digressing here. The point is you would learn to be aggressive, right? You've learned to get aggressive. You've learned to interact or react in that way, right? How can I, how can I disentangle the genetics with the environmental side? And this is what we're looking at today. So we're going to have a look starting off with um, twin studies in a second. Let's have a let's get a definition of uh, first of all. So genetic factors. What are genetic factors? So genetic factors. Genes consist of DNA strands. I'm going to say DNA strands. DNA produces instructions for general. physical, I'm going to go with, features of an organism such as eye colour and height and also specific physical features such as mm, neurotransmitter level and size of brain structure. Nice. <laughs> These may impact on Psychological features such as intelligence and mental disorders. Genes are transmitted from parent to offspring, i.e. inherited. Did it. 
So genetic factors are genes that consist of DNA strands. DNA produces instructions for general physical features of organisms, such as eye color and height, right? Genes definitely determine your eye color, your height, your hair color. These are all things that we know genes 100% definitely cause. However, there are other features, also specific features that include uh, included such as neurotransmitter level and size of brain structure. These may impact on psychological features such as intelligence and mental disorder. So that's to say that intelligence isn't just genetic. There may be things like size of brain structure might, that might affect your intelligence, but it's not just genetic. Genes are transmitted from parent to offspring, i.e. they are inherited. You are 50% your mother and 50% your father, right? That's where you get your 100% of your genes from. Let's get started with twin studies to understand aggression, right? Get a couple twins, see how they're similar, see how they're different. That will help us understand genetics, won't it? So several twin studies have suggested that heritability, i.e. genetic factors, account for about 50% of the variance in aggressive behavior. So that's a lot, right? If you go, well, half the reason why you're aggressive is because from your genetics. You go, oh, that's quite a big chunk. You know, that's quite a big chunk of where you get your aggression from. But that's only half, right? The other half come from other factors as well. So these are other factors that we're going to have to discover and explore later on. But it shows that genetic factors do play a large role. For example, Kokora et al. in 97 studied adult, male, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Because monozygotic twins share 100% of their genes, but dizygotic twins share only 50% on average. We would expect to find greater similarities in aggression uh, in aggressive behaviour between monozygotic twins if aggression is mostly influenced by genetics. Yeah, so if we get monozygotic twins who are 100% genetically the same and dizygotic twins who are 50% genetically the same if you compare the two they usually have had both the same brought they've been brought up the same right you're whether you're identical twins or non-identical twins you're usually brought up in the same environment you're brought up in the same household you probably went to the same school you probably got treated relatively dis, uh, similar to the other twin so any differences between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins must be from the fact that actually their genetics are not 100% the same with each other. So the reason why you have monozygotic twins is it means there was one egg, so one female egg and one sperm, and the sperm came in and fertilized the egg. And then the egg, for some reason, is split into two eggs. So you've got two eggs now both with the exact same genetic uh, material, both that have come from one egg and one sperm, and now you've got two of them, but they've both got exactly the same genetics. Whereas dizygotic twins, non-identical twins, is when a woman has released two eggs and two separate sperms come and fertilize those two eggs. So you've got dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins. This is because both monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins are raised together in the same environment, but monozygotic twins have a greater degree of genetic similarity than dizygotic twins. For example, for aggressive behaviour defined as direct physical assault, the researchers found concordance rates of 50% of monozygotic twins and 19% for dizygotic twins. So they found that if um, one twin was one identical twin was physically aggressive or had had been uh, had done physical assault, then there was a 50 percent chance that the other twin would also have done it. Whereas for dizygotic twins, only there was only a 19 percent concordance rate. So if one um, twin had done it, there was a 19 percent chance that the other one would have done some sort of physical assault as well. The corresponding fi uh, fi figures for verbal aggression were 28% for monozygotic and 7% for dizygotic. Interesting. Watch this video to understand why we use twin studies, right? So check out the link on the video. It, under it helps you understand why we use twin studies, the importance of twin studies, and the way in which we use it to try and disentangle the environmental side of uh, inheritance and the genetic side of it as well. So how do we disentangle these two factors, right? Nature versus nurture, genetics versus environment. 
and that was twin studies, right? Identify one thing you learned about twin studies. This isn't the first time we looked at twin studies. We look at twin studies all the time to understand different types of behaviors, whether that be, you know, attachment types, that could be schizophrenia, that could be social influence. We look at twin studies to try and understand, to try and disentangle environmental factors and genetic factors. Why do you think learning about twin studies is important? The video will look through that as well. How does twin studies apply in real life? And what questions has twin studies raised for you? What are you still wondering about? Right, so show comprehension and apply knowledge of twin studies. Are we happy to tick that off? Brilliant. Lovely. Now we're going to have a look to identify and analyze adoption studies. Adoption studies. Similarities in aggressive behavior between an adoptive child and their biological parents suggest that genetic influences are operating. Similarities with the adopted parents suggest that environmental influences are, are operating. So if you think about it, sometimes you see those shows where a child has been lost and has been adopted by someone else or um, they haven't seen their biological family or anyone about that for for like hundred for tens of years, not hundreds, no one's it's not hundreds of years, tens of years, right? <clears throat> and then they go and meet them and they go, oh, look how look how sim look how many similarities there are. We look the same, sometimes we talk the same, they do the same similar mannerisms or possibly, and you go, oh, that must be from genetics because there's no way that they've shared the same environment because they've been adopted and never met their their biological family or biological parents so any any similarities they have with their biological family they've never met before must be from their genetics because it's certainly not from their environment and any similarities between an adopted child and their parents their their adopted parents and so not their biological parents must be things that have been learned from the environment it must be things that they're environmental so you've learned to do those things from that situation that you've been brought up with them so let's think about that in terms of aggression if there are similarities from adopted children to their biological parents that will mean that oh well that must mean aggression must have some sort of genetic predisposition whereas if you're aggressive because your non-biological parents or your adopted parents are also aggressive may it must mean that it's something from the environment it's something that you learn let's have a look at some research shall we so re and inwin waldman carried out a meta-analysis of adoption studies of direct aggression and antisocial behavior a prominent feature of which is aggressive behavior they found that genetic influences accounted for 41% of the variance in aggression, more or less in line with findings from the twin studies. So the twin studies suggested that around 50% was down to genetics. This study, which wasn't, uh, which was looking at adoption rather than twin studies, found 41%. That's quite similar if you think of it. It's in the same sort of ballpark, right? Twin studies suggest 50%. Adoption studies like this one has suggested 41%. So what's one thing you learned about adoption studies? Why do you think learning about adoption studies is important? Well, again, we spoke about how it, it helps us sort of disentangle the genetic side and the environmental side. And how does adoption studies apply in real life? Again, if you have any questions, please write them down and uh, put them in an email to me or ask me in person or put them in the comment section. So LO2, identify and analyze adoption studies. We had a quick look over adoption studies. Let's tick that one off. Tick. Next, interpret and understand the importance of the Mawa gene. Mawa, M-O-A-O-M. Mawa. The Mawa gene. Let's get a definition. Let's complete the definition. The Mawa gene. The gene responsible for the activity of the enzyme monoamine oxidize in the brain. The low activity variant of the gene is closely associated with aggressive behavior. I'm smashing it. This gene regulates the metabolism of serotonin in the brain. Here we go. So the Mauer gene is the gene responsible for the activity of the enzyme monoamine oxidized oxidase in the brain the low activity variant of the gene is closely associated with aggressive behavior so low activity 
of the gene equals aggressive behavior. The gene regulates the metabolism of serotonin in the brain. So again, we're linking the biological perspective now. So we're saying the serotonin, it's saying this malware gene. So it's saying genes affect aggression, but the genes is affected the serotonin in the brain. And as we know, the serotonin regulates how much self-control we have. If you have less self-control, you're more likely to get aggressive when you're angry. If I have high, if I have high self-control and someone's making me very angry, which can happen in lessons sometimes, I'm able to control myself because I have high self-control. If I had low levels of serotonin, I wouldn't be able to control myself and maybe I'd result in aggression and anger, but I won't. The Mauer gene is also known as the warrior gene, as people with low activity versions of the Mauer gene are more likely to respond with aggression when provoked. Monoamine oxidase A, which is what Mauer stands for, is an enzyme. Its role is to mop up neurotransmitters in the brain after a nerve impulse has been transmitted from one neuron to another. It does this by breaking down the neurotransmitter, especially serotonin, into constituent chemicals to be recycled or excreted, a process called catabolism. The production of this enzyme is determined by the Mauer gene. A dysfunction in the operation of this gene may lead to abnormal activities of the Mauer enzyme, which in turn affects levels of serotonin in the brain. And as we know, serotonin is regulating self-control. Oh, here we go. This is from the previous lesson, but I'll recap as well. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter involved in communication of impulses between neurons. It has widespread inhibitory effects on the brain. It slows down and dampens neuronal activity. Normal levels of serotonin in the orbitable frontal cortex are linked with reduced firings of neurons, and this is associated with a greater degree of behavioral self-control. Decreased serotonin may well, may well disturb this mechanism, reducing self-control and leading to an increase in impulsive behavior, possibly aggression. One variant of the Mauer gene, Mauer L, nicknamed the warrior gene, leads to low Mauer activity in the brain and has been associated with various forms of aggressive behavior. For example, Brunner et al. in 93 studied 28 male members of a large Dutch family who were repeatedly involved in impulsive, aggressive, violent criminal behaviours such as rape, attempted murder and physical assault. So it's not a very nice Dutch family. When you think of Dutch, you think I'm nice, you think, yeah, Dutch. Yeah, we really like, we like the Dutch, they're really nice people. The researchers also found that these men had abnormally low levels of malware in the brain and the low activity versions of the of the gene. So this large Dutch family were really aggressive. They were impulsively aggressive, violent family who were always doing these horrible things such as raping and murdering and physically assaulting people, right? So this would be a perfect example of who to look at. Look at let's look at this family. Let's find out if they've got high levels or low levels of this malware gene. Maybe genes might understand the way in which this family is um, is behaving. Stuart et al. studied 97 men who, because they have been involved in inflicting intimate partner violence, were part of a batterer treatment program. Men with the low activity Mauer gene were found to be the most violent perpetrators of IPV, which is intimate partner violence. They engaged in the highest levels of physical and psychological aggression and inflicted the worst injuries on their partners. So men with low activity Mauer gene were found to be the most violent perpetrators, right? These were the people that were going to abuse and beat their, uh, beat their um, wives. So this was a study of men. Who's, who's to say what, what effect this would have on women? Maybe this will be one of the evaluative points. Let's have a look at a question now. So Barney's aggressive kids. Barney has three children in their teens and all of them seem to behave quite aggressively. They have all been in trouble at school for getting into fights. They take after their mother 
who who even has a criminal record for assault. Barney's father, who was also a very aggressive person, who even spent some time in prison for seriously assaulting a teacher. Oh, I'm scared. Barney's worried that aggression runs in families in it and is concerned how his grandchildren, if he ever has any, will turn out. Use your knowledge of genetic factors in aggression. Explain how Barney is right to be concerned. So, so from what we've learned in this lesson regarding twin studies, regarding adoption studies, and regarding research into the Mauer gene, why should Barney be concerned that his grandchildren might also be aggressive, just as his teen children are? Right, write your answer down, give that a go, and I'm going to go through the answers. Now, using your knowledge of genetic factors in aggression, explain how Barney is right to be concerned. One reason Barney should be concerned is because research shows that aggressive behaviour does run in families, and it is likely to be genetic. For instance, one identical twin is highly aggressive, the other is very likely to be highly aggressive, more so than for non-identical twins. So that must show that genetic factors must be playing some sort of role here. They found 50% concordance rates. Research has even been able to identify one gene that seems to be especially influential, the Mauer gene. Men who inherit the low activity variant of this gene have been shown to be more aggressive and violent in several studies. For example, towards their partners. It is possible that this is the mechanism by which aggression is transmitted through Barney's family. Maybe Barney's family have a low activity Mauer gene and this is why they're so aggressive. However, it is really important that Barney understands that research also shows that the Mauer gene does not operate in isolation or on its own. The low variant version of the gene is only associated with aggression in people who have experienced significant childhood traumas. So this is something we're going to look at in a second. If Barney's grandchildren can be protected from such experiences, they will probably turn out to be no more aggressive than most other people. So it's suggesting that you need a combination of both the Mauer gene and an environmental experience that might set that off. So the Mauer gene, identify one thing you learned about the Mauer gene. Why do you think learning about the Mauer gene is important? Well, it helps us understand aggression better. How does the Mauer gene apply in real life? It will help us understand why certain individuals are more aggressive. It will help, say, for example, I'm a really aggressive person. I want to find out why am I so aggressive? Is it because of my family? Is it because of my genes? Or is it because of the environment I grew up in? And you can do some research and find out, well, actually, I've got a really low activity of the Mauer gene, and that results in me being really aggressive. Maybe you can try and use that as an excuse in court. Maybe. Maybe it won't work. And then what questions has the Mauer gene raised for you? What are you still wondering about? Are you wondering about anything? Let me know. So. Learning objective three, interpret and understand the importance of the Mauer gene in aggression. Are we happy? We are. Good. Let's move on to the final bit now. Examine and explain gene environment interactions. Gene environment interactions. Genes are crucial influences on aggressive behavior, but they do not function in isolation. It appears to be the case that low Mauer gene activity is only related to adult aggression when combined with early traumatic life events. So genes or the Mauer gene or low activity of the Mauer gene only results in aggression when it is combined with early traumatic life events. An early traumatic life event is an environmental thing. It happens in your environment. So it's saying that similar to how um, we understand schizophrenia, where you need to have the genetic predisposition, it also is onset by a traumatic life event. And this, this, is, this is very similar to what, we found, uh, to, to what is found in aggression, how you need low activity of that Mauer gene but you need that life event that will onset that original, uh, that original predisposition that you have. For example, Frazetto et al. in 2007 found an association between higher levels of antisocial aggression 
and the low activity Mauer gene variant in adult males as expected, but this was only the case in those who had experienced significant trauma, significant trauma such as sexual or physical abuse during the first 15 years of life. So only when you've experienced sexual or physical abuse, as well as having low activity MOA gene, will this result in aggression later on in life or having a tendency to be aggressive. So you may have low activity Mauer gene. I might have a low activity Mauer gene, but because I haven't had a significant trauma in my life, such as sexual or physical abuse, therefore it doesn't matter and I'm not an aggressive individual. Some may argue. I am in some cases. Grr. Those who are not experienced, those who had not experienced such childhood trauma did not have particularly high levels of aggression as adults even if they possess the low activity Mauer variant. This is strong evidence of a gene interaction, gene environment interaction, sometimes described as a diathesis stress, right? This is familiar to us, diathesis stress. The diathesis is the genetic part of it. You need to have the genetic predisposition to be aggressive. And then you need to have the stress, which is the trauma, the life event, the things that happen environmentally for, uh, for aggression to be the outcome. Let's have a look at another example. Ashley and her twin. Ashley and Marina are identical twins in their late teens. They grew up doing everything together. They had the same friends, went to the same places and wore similar clothes. Even their parents sometimes had trouble telling them apart. Everyone who met them commented on how polite, friendly, and happy they both were. But a few years ago, Marina was involved in a serious car accident. The physical scars are healing, but she seems like a different person. She's much more irritable and quite aggressive, even sometimes physically so. She's very different from her twin sister these days. That's sad. Question. Use your knowledge of the role of genetic factors and genetic and environment interactions to explain why Marina's behaviour has changed. Why might have Marina's behaviour changed? Understanding what we know about gene environment interactions now. Right, write your answer down and then I'm going to go through my answer now. So please feel free to pause the video. Answer. It is possible that both Ashley and Marina inherited the low variant version of the Mauer gene, which has been nicknamed the warrior gene because of its association with aggressive behavior. However, this does not mean that either of them will necessarily behave aggressively. This certainly seems to be the case for both of them, described as they are polite, friendly and happy. Research shows that the low variant version of the gene interacts with significant environmental trauma in childhood to produce aggression. As Marina has experienced such a trauma, the car accident, before she was a teenager, but Ashley didn't, this could explain the difference between them and the change in Marina's behavior. So maybe it was the incident of the car crash which is significant as the early trauma instead of a physical or sexual assault. Maybe it was a car, maybe it was a car getting in a car crash, which is that traumatic event. And this has led to the Mauer gene becoming activated, which is why she is now aggressive, but her twin, who is not in the accident, is now aggressive. However, a more simple explanation might be, of course, it might just be that she's become very resentful because of her scars. Right, maybe. Identify one thing you learned about the gene environment interactions. Why do you think learning about gene environment interactions is important? How does gene environment interactions apply in real life? And what questions has gene interactions raised for you? What are you still wondering about? Examine and explain gene environment interactions. Done. Plenary. Watch the video, what makes us fight, right? So it's a nine, 10 minute video on what makes us fight. And it sort of explains some of the genetic factors that might influence aggressive behavior. Next lesson, we're gonna be having a look at the evaluation. So check out this video, what makes us fight. Write up all the notes from today's lesson. I look forward to seeing them. Keep up the good work. 
Um, I'm going to see some of you live in lessons, but keep yourselves in safe in lockdown, right? I've been Mr. Neo. Welcome to Neo Psychology. Take care and I'll see you next time.